top of me. So I looked at the judge, the judge looked at me, and I've never felt more credible on the stand, despite my fear at the time. Glenn's the kind of guy we tend to imagine when somebody uses the term psychopath, someone who's vicious, violent, and impulsive. And because his behavior is so bizarre, it's easy to assume that what Dr. Porter meant when he called Glenn a psychopath was that he was, well, completely nuts. But psychopathy isn't actually about being crazy. It's a lot more complex than that. Dr. Robert Hare is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of British Columbia, and arguably the world leader in the study of psychopathic behavior, or psychopathy. He says the idea that psychopaths are crazy is a common misconception. Well, a psychopath is not what the news media uh, portray him or her to be. That is, they're not psychotic, they're not crazy, they're not nuts. Every caption writer for a newspaper article says, psycho boss, psycho this, psycho that. These are not people who are um, mentally, uh, psychiatrically, or um, even legally insane. They're, they're perfectly intact individuals. And having said that, uh, I'll describe them as in the, uh, people who, I think at the core, lack a real concern, an emotional connection with other people. They don't seem to understand that other people have uh, rights. And I think this is partly because of a, um, a stunning uh, incapacity, a lack of capacity for empathy. I think if you wanted a shorthand term, this would be people who lack a conscience, and uh, this the so-called lack of conscience can't be explained in terms of, say, um, intellectual deficiency or uh, some sort of psychosis or mental illness or brain damage. Dr. Harris says the confusion partly stems from the fact that psychopath is often confused with psychotic. Now, psychotic refers to a break with reality, that kind of hallucinations and delusions that, say, a patient with schizophrenia may have. Psychotic patients can sometimes act bizarre, and they can be violent. But generally, someone who's psychotic isn't aware of the consequences of their actions. Psychopaths, on the other hand, know exactly when they're up to no good. They just don't seem to care. So, technically speaking, my favorite psycho, Norman Bates, who has conversations with his dead mother and dresses up like her to kill people, is really psychotic and not a psychopath. And while we're on the topic of confusing jargon, people also tend to mix up psychopath with the term sociopath. It's an understandable mistake, but in fact a sociopath is really just a fancy term for a hardcore criminal. A sociopath might be real nasty, they could even be a hired killer or a hitman, but that doesn't necessarily make them a psychopath if they're still capable of feeling remorse or guilt. So while lots of psychopaths are also sociopaths, there's more to being a psychopath than just a long rap sheet. Dr. Hare says that psychopaths have a specific cluster of personality traits that tend to go hand in hand with nasty behavior. And uh, of course associated with that are all sorts of other things. We have individuals whose uh, emotional life is fairly shallow, uh, fairly superficial. Uh, these are uh, people who uh, use deceit and manipulation to intimidate and control other individuals. Uh, tend to be fairly dominant and controlling people, enormous sense of entitlement. They believe that uh, everything is really due to them simply because of who they are. Uh, tend to be uh, fairly impulsive, but in a c controlled sense, uh, maybe lead a nomadic lifestyle. Uh, a lot of irresponsible behavior, uh, need for excitement. And, of course, all of these things together really describe somebody who would find it very easy to uh, violate the social mores and norms of society, and that would include criminal behavior, but not exclusively so. So it's not to say that all psychopaths are like Hannibal Lecter, a predatory killer with a perverse taste for human flesh and Italian wine. Even real serial killers like Clifford Olson or Paul Bernardo aren't really representative. The majority of psychopaths will probably never kill anyone, and they don't even necessarily have to be particularly violent. Dr. Hare says there are plenty of what he calls white-collar psychopaths out there, people who use manipulation, deceit, and charm to pull off non-violent crimes like fraud and embezzlement. So, if a psychopath isn't just another term for a crazed serial killer, what exactly does it mean? That's a question Dr. Hare has focused on for much of his career. Starting in the late 70s, he and his colleagues set out to develop a precise definition of psychopathy. They gathered up clinical cases and boiled them down until they had a list of 20 essential psychopathic traits. Some traits describe deviant behavior. For example, pathological lying, irresponsibility, and behavioral problems as a kid. Other traits describe a particular emotional profile. Things like shallow feelings, a lack of guilt or remorse, sexual promiscuity, and superficial charm. Now, while none of these traits on its own defines a psychopath, taken together they do. 
Dr. Hare's work on compiling these traits culminated in the early 90s with the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. Today it's the clinical tool most often used to assess psychopaths, and the kind of widely accepted definition scientists needed in order to study them. So now, equipped with Dr. Hare's trusty checklist, researchers have begun in earnest to try to get inside the head of a psychopath. Dr. James Blair is one of those researchers. He heads up the Cognitive Neuroscience Unit at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and he argues that psychopathy is a type of emotional disorder. Dr. Blair believes it isn't so much that psychopaths don't care about other people, but that they can't care. He says psychopaths simply have trouble processing emotional information. Scientifically, you can see specific types of emotional learning that are impaired, um, the way that emotion interacts with attention to prime up particularly salient uh, objects in the environment, that's also disrupted. And the way that emotion is so important for decision-making in healthy individuals, that type of decision-making is also disrupted in individuals with psychopathy. If I showed you a frightened or a sad face, you would start to perspire ever so slightly. That would be your, one of your sort of basic emotional responses. These individuals show that reaction to a lesser extent. Similarly, if if I showed you the emotional face, um, the fearful face, you'd say, well, that's a fearful face, or you should be saying that's a fearful face. These individuals need a more intense stimulus, a more intense face, a more expressive face before they can actually name the expression in front of them, particularly the fearful expression. Dr. Blair refers to psychopathy as an emotional disorder comparable to, say, clinical depression or anxiety. And he's convinced the emotional learning problems psychopaths have are caused by differences in the way their brains work. So he and his colleagues are carrying out MRI studies in order to look at the brain activity of children who have psychopathic tendencies. Dr. Blair. So one of the very simplest tasks that we're doing at the moment is just looking at the response in the brain to different types of emotional expressions, particularly fearful and angry emotional expressions, because um, fearful faces are so good in healthy individuals at generating responses in the amygdala. And we're examining to see whether these responses are uh, muted, are much less there in children who have these marked emotional difficulties. And what we seem to be seeing is that these children who have these problems in reduced anxiety, reduced guilt, are indeed showing uh, notably reduced responses in their amygdala to frightened faces of other individuals. Dr. Blair believes that the reduced activity in the amygdala, two tiny almond-sized structures deep in the temporal lobes of the brain, may account for some of the problems these kids have in processing emotional information. And it may help explain why the kids Dr. Blair is studying have trouble interpreting fearful faces. The amygdala are also important when it comes to feeling fear. So Dr. Blair's findings may also help explain why psychopaths don't seem to be afraid of getting caught when they commit a crime. And the research might also account for psychopaths' apparent lack of conscience. If you have trouble interpreting when someone's feeling good or bad, it would be almost impossible to learn the difference between good and bad behavior. 